Thank you for the name that is above every other name. Today we exalt the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your wonderful Holy Spirit. We love, we honor, we bless you, we praise you. We ask again that you would speak to us in this atmosphere. Cause us to have understanding of all things. The scriptures are clear. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for making known the will of God to us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bless you, Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a praise today. Come on. Hallelujah. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Take your seats. Amen. Amen. Well, we're glad to be in the presence of the Lord. Together as family, say amen. We can get into the word today and let the Lord speak to us. Is this mic okay or can you hear me well? Hello? Okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We've been dealing for the last few weeks from the subject of the purpose and power of the fivefold ministry, understanding that these ministries are ordained by Jesus Himself. Amen. And if Jesus saw it fit to give it to the body of Christ, it is our responsibility to believe for the fullness of the fivefold ministry or we will be lacking. Say amen. It's time for you to be fully fed and well balanced as God allows these ministry gifts to come to fruition in this hour. We spoke about the apostle who moves forward, the body of Christ, amen with structure and governmental authority, establishing churches. We looked at the prophet who stands before God and who hears from God on behalf of God. He speaks before the people. Say amen. amen. Then we looked at the evangelist who, has, who is God's advertising agency. Amen. The evangelistic ministry must be saturated with signs and wonders and miracles. Amen. To bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Lordship of the kingdom of God in the earth. And then today we will be dealing with the ministry of the pastor. Say amen. Our text, Ephesians 4, 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Again, I told you the Greek says, And he gave some indeed, emphatically, apostles some indeed prophets and some indeed evangelists and some indeed pastors and teachers. Now again, by way of reminder, only 5% of the body of Christ is fivefold ministry. Amen. Back in the day when we were coming up in youth and, and, and growing up in church, if you had a passion for God, 
then everyone generally assumed you belong in the fivefold ministry. If you love God excessively and you're a person of prayer and of study and of the word, then they would assume you are called to be in the fivefold ministry. And a lot of men and women have missed their destiny because they listen to people. One thing about God, He hides your purpose inside of you so that nobody can mess with it. It does not come from the outside. It's inside of you. It's only when you come into the right environment that it wakes up. Just like Samuel, born to be a prophet, when he was in the right environment, who could hear the voice of God. He was raised up in the house of God, the right environment, and he could not discern yet, but he was growing until his mentor helped him and said, hey, whenever you hear that voice, say, speak, Lord, your servant is hearing. Say, amen. So you find that because you love God intensely, then people assume you should be in the ministry. I remember a story of this young businessman who was was very successful as a businessman and he got saved, radically saved. And because he had such a passion for God, everybody told him he should be in the ministry. So he started in youth ministry and he became the youth pastor of the church. But in all the years he was there, he never had more than 20 young people. And he struggled and struggled until someone taught him and said, listen, you have been given an anointing to make money for the kingdom. And you, you, you quit all of that to do, to do ministry. And what happened was he failed because he wasn't called. He let people push him into where he doesn't belong. Don't let people decide what you are called to do. Find out from God for yourself. Ah, you don't hear me. Amen. Because you will miss your destiny listening to people. Look at Jesus. Jesus, when he came on the scene, they told him, why don't you join the Sahindran Council? Why don't you become a Pharisee? Why don't, oh, Jesus stayed focused on his purpose. His own disciples said, you know what? We can go to Rome and make you king now. And the Bible said what? He withdrew himself. When he perceived that the crowd was going to make him king, he withdrew himself. It's tempting to think, Yo, I have the whole nation behind me. We can literally overthrow the government. But he stayed focused on his calling. He knew, I am born to die, and that's where I'm going. And even when Satan got in the mouth of Peter and said, and said to him, you won't go to the cross, far be it from you, Lord. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Stay focused on what you're called to do. Amen? And don't ask nobody. Ask God. If someone comes and prophesies, it will be what God has already told you. That will just solidify your decision to pursue God in the area He has called you. So whether you in the, like I said, 95% of us belong in the world somewhere doing something. Not fivefold. Huh? Yellow cake me. Let me come this side. You understand? So, it, so remember the fivefold ministry is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The fivefold ministry is not responsible for all the work. They are responsible for demonstrating the work to you, but then training you to do the work. So in other words, a true pastor will train you to pastor. Ah, you see, because we are all supposed to do the work of the ministry in whatever capacity of our gifting. So if, if, you, if you did redemptive, you should know what I'm talking about. We talked about your temperament styles. Some of you will be lost, and it's good because you don't listen. <laughs> so the rest will understand. Your temperament style has an indication of your motivational gift. Right? And so your motivational gift, the, 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 the fivefold ministry will speak to that gift and wake it up. And then with that gift, you serve the body of Christ and you serve the world. In whatever capacity. If you have the gift of compassion, for example, then it's likely that you have a pastoral gift, though you're not a pastor. Ah, you were many. And therefore, God will show you in the church house how to minister counseling to people. Huh? Some of you are so compassionate. Yeah, heal for Allah. As next week, you're at me. It's because you got a pastoral heart. The, 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 pastoral heart, <laughs> the pastoral heart is like this. I can be prophesying over Nadine here and he'll say, 
And say, but why? Then she's so happy for her because of her heart of compassion. <laughs> the compassion gift is so amazing that, that you can fake all of us out. Yeah. Come in here smiling. Hey, hey, hey. And say, the compassion person, come here, so what's going on? Do you know people like that? What's going on with you? How come? Ah, hello. Hello, you have seen. First time, it's because they are the empathy of God, the heart. So they see. So in the church house, there are people like that. Who needs to be, you will make good counselors. Then you can sit with people one on one and help them. Say amen. And so, and, you, and, you, and if you look at the motivational gift of the see or the perceiver, then it's a prophetic gift. So, the prophet will come and stir that up in you where you can begin to see warnings. So, when you get up and preach, at is lot. But we need to be whooped now and then. You can't do what they want. You hit the foolishness out of their heart. So, sometimes a strong word will come and whoop us all. And we need it so that we don't fall in the ditch. If you're going to fall in the ditch, I can't be casual. Watch the ditch. Watch. Watch the ditch. It's a warning, isn't it? So that we need all of those facets of God to get a full, healthy diet spiritually. Say amen. Hallelujah. So now let's look at the, 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 the shepherd. Again, we told you Jesus was the perfect apostle, the perfect prophet, the perfect evangelist, the perfect pastor, and the perfect teacher. Go to the book of John chapter 10. In the book of John chapter 10, Jesus preached to his crew. Hallelujah. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. This is Jesus talking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Already, shepherd is where we get the word pastor from. Notice, pastor, pasture. So the pastor leads you to the green pastures to feed. Right? The primary function of the pastor is to have you to feed. And we're going to see some of those things in the scripture. Now let's look at what, what it means to be the good shepherd. Hallelujah. Now Jesus, in John chapter 10, the phrase the good shepherd in the Greek, good shepherd in the Greek is poimen ho kalos. <laughs> it's deep stuff, ne? The word poimen refers to shepherd, the feeder, the protector, the ruler of a flock of men. It is, and when it comes to Jesus, the, use, the, definite, the definite article is the, the good shepherd. In other words, he is the primary example of what a shepherd is like. Now, what does the shepherd do? He leaves the 99 to find the one. You see it so vividly in the life of Peter. When Peter messed up, he literally thought he was canceled from apostleship. Huh? Because the minute he betrayed Christ, he thought, I have been canceled because I failed. But what does Jesus do? When he raised from the dead, he tells, he tells Mary, he says, go tell my disciples and Peter. He emphasized because he knows what's going on in Peter's heart. He says, tell him, He's part of the group. And he restores Peter. There's a conversation that the Bible does not tell us about where Jesus meets with Peter and restores him. Peter denied him three times, correct? Then when Jesus restores him, he asked him three times, Do you love me? To reverse the denial. Do you love me? Peter said, You know I love you. He says, Simon, do you love me? He says, you know I love you, Lord. He says, Simon, do you love me? And Peter's heart was grieved because he asked him three times. But what Jesus was trying to show Peter, it's not about your love for me, Peter. It's my love for you. When you understand I love you beyond your faults and failures, and you are still accepted, that is the pastoral heart of Jesus, to restore those that are fallen and broken. Say amen. amen. So now, the word poimen, 
the feeder, the shepherd, the one over a flock. And the definite whole kalos means, refers to the excellent one. The one who is the supreme example. So there you see Jesus, the pastor. Then the word, he giveth his life. The word there in the Greek is tethemi, which means to place, lay down, or to establish. The shepherd gives his life. In other words, he lays it down in order to establish the sheep in the things of God. Say amen. So that they are solid in the things of God. Hallelujah. And he lays down his life for the sheep is the Greek word hupo, which means on behalf of. You lay your life down on behalf of the sheep. Jesus puts it this way in the book of John chapter 17. He says, I sanctify myself for their sake. So the life of consecration and commitment you live, it's not because you're trying to be special. You have to in order to be a minister. Whatever you are called to do, you can't do what everybody else does. If you want to succeed at it. The people who succeed at anything in life is the ones who are totally focused on it. You become obsessed with the thing you do. That's when you succeed. Michael Jackson was obsessed. Michael would rehearse until he drop. He would go into his room of mirrors and dance until he can't anymore. And you wonder why he was so successful. He was extremely intense. When he was recording the Thriller album with, 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 with Quincy Jones, Quincy was sick when Michael was done with him. No, literally. Because Michael was like, I'm not happy. Can we do that again? I'm not happy. Can we? And it became the most successful album of all time. Still today, nobody has topped it. He himself couldn't beat it. <laughs> he tried. Couldn't. But because of that work ethic... And so sometimes we just look at people as, and see talent. You don't understand the work to make the talent shine. You didn't just wake up and be talented. You, we all are talented, but some work more on it than others. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, I'm a diamond. I may be still in the rough. <laughs> sometimes you need to polish that thing. Chip off. Once you find your gift, it's your responsibility to work it. Paul, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, he says, give yourself wholly to this so that your progress may be evident to those who follow you. Amen. When you work the gift, people will pay you to watch it. Tiger Woods says, I can't believe people are willing to pay me so much to do what I love. Because while you and I were ignoring that home, Four o'clock in the morning was on the golf course. Whoosh, ah, not happy with that. Whoosh, ah, and day in and day out and day in because of passion. Only passion can make you that committed. You can't be committed to what you're not passionate about. This is why it's vital that everyone finds their place because your place is your passion. They don't have to pay you to do it. You will love it. Look at Sister Carlin. We don't have to force her to come here. Say, so yes, the year. Passion. When I give her songs, the Salamak may quote will name When I give a song, Carlin will come and say, I cannot let us run. I don't have to work still on the song. She knows it. Even Elster knows the songs. That's how much she plays it at home. You can't, you can't force that if someone is not passionate. You see what I'm saying? And every one of us have a passion. When you start talking about it, then blink your ear. That's what happens when you're passionate about something. You come alive. One of our buddies, he loves guns. He was a reserve police officer. And he was so frustrated with that casual approach to the police, to policing. He despised the way they disrespected it. Because the minute you start talking about guns, I've never seen a guy come so alive. I say, yeah, my bro, say what I gun. Then blind he works. And we look at him, you know. And us is like, I'd pride you. Because it's not our thing. You see what I'm saying? So that's why you need to find people with the same thing that's your thing. 
So you will charge one another. So it's fear. You just talk to each other. Don't go, <laughs> don't go sit there on the corner with guys who have no vision, who have no dreams. You're going to stay there. 20 years and pratele nog van die selle ding. Op die selle hoek, rak out op die hoek. Ja, en nooit die jaar is aan dan. En nooit die tjeri. Selle prijkies. 20 years later, they have not grown anywhere. And if you become part of that fellowship, that's where you will stay. Birds of a feather flock together. Meng you many siemels dan? Ah, you look in the good. Okay, say okay. <laughs> then the script, the word life, oh, this is good. The word life, the shepherd gives his life. It's not Zoe. Zoe life is the abundant life. Jesus, in, in John 10, 10, he says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. That's talking about Zoe life. Zoe life, it means life of the quality and quantity of God. So when Jesus says, I came to give you Zoe life, I don't want you to just have a normal life. It's life as God has life. The God kind of life. But in this verse, it's not Zoe. It's a funny word. Let me read it. Hallelujah. It's the word, what is that word now? Suke. Say suke. Where we get the word psyche. Psychiatry. Psychology, which is the study of the mind, the will, and emotions. So what is he saying? I give my mind, my will, my emotion, my body, all of it in order to be your shepherd. My whole being is directed towards lifting you, feeding you, protecting you, guiding you, governing you. That's Jesus. The example of a pastor. Say amen. Now let's look at some... Pakri verses. Say, are you ready for it? Yo, this is hectic. Go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34. We're going to read from verse 1. Now, this is where God rebukes the shepherds for not doing their job. And in his rebuke of them, he shows you his qualifying criteria for a shepherd. Are you ready for it? And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, I say unto them, Thus say the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Mm. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Hasn't that been the case in the body of Christ these days? The pastor is prospering. This is what God was upset about. You eat the fat. Hmm? eat you shelled. And you clothe yourself with wool, the best outfits that you can create that money can buy. You kill them that are fed. In other words, the ones that are strong, you destroy them because well, they're going to rebuke you and stand in your way. But you feed not the flock. God isn't a problem with you being taken care of. Jesus, Paul writes, he says, he says, he that preaches the gospel should live off the gospel. So God is not a problem with you prospering as his child, particularly if you are his servant. Why do you use his asphalt? And you are his servant. You're not a good testimony. Is it var? But God is saying, I don't mind you prospering, but what about my people? Feed them so they must also prosper. Who can you alien prosper? In the minute your people get money, it's a, let's have an offering. Pastor's appreciation. Ah. They can't even buy themselves anything because they will not offering, offering, offering the other day. That's what's happening in the body of Christ. And it's a stench in the nostrils of God. Say, Ena. None of us here do that so thankfully. <laughs> but you feed not the flock. Next verse. The diseased have you not strengthened. As your first, the disease you have not strengthened. So the diseased, when you are 
have no ease, it's the pastoral responsibility to bring you to ease. Because you were diseased. So whether it's emotionally, whether it's physically, whether it's relationally, the, 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 the pastoral responsibility is to bring you to a place of ease. Bring the peace so you can have the ease. Huh? So they've not done their job because they were like, we're looking good, but I have no clue what's happening to my people. I have no clue what they are feeling because I'm not there to touch them at that level. Say amen. Neither have you healed that which is sick. Are you sick in your relationship? It must be healed. Counseling must take place. Are you sick in your finance? You must be given financial wisdom and help. Do you see pastoral responsibility? Like titles, ne? Dan do you need work? People just love the titles. They don't see the work. And remember, if God calls you, you are responsible. Amen. Neither have you healed that which is sick. Neither have you bound up that which is broken. Because of that pastoral compassionate gift, it has the ability to sense and minister right at the point of your hurt and lead you out of pain. And it's not an overnight thing. It's a constant walking. This is why a pastoral gift is very patient. The prophetic gift, again, is, is very impatient. Come right, man. That's the prophetic gift. What do you want to do? We're going to do it. That's the prophetic gift, right? But the pastoral gift says, He's on the scoff. He's raw. You can't even talk to the people. No, 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 no. And the pastor will... Is it not? And sometimes you don't, the pastor has got such compassion for people. And, and, and you know what? You look at them and say, Er, daina mag jou dom pastoor, man. Hoekom bly, hoekom bly achter daina loop? But the pastor had just says, Ah, kom hier, man. I got some more oil for you. Ek wil die name noem jou, man, pastor, lobby. And we can look at, we can look at some people and dink, Tjrr, man, die mense wil hier recht kom hier, man. <laughs> Pastoral gift does not do that. They will walk after you patiently and follow you and restore you. It's so needed. Say amen. So I don't care what fivefold gift you have, you still need a pastor. Even if I'm an apostle, I would need a pastor. Ah, you don't hear me. Even if I'm a prophet, even if you have your own ministry, you need a pastor. Amal kreisier. Say, tell your neighbor, as by the world. <laughs> we all go through stuff, and you need a pastor to come and apply the ointment. Say amen. amen. <laughs> neither have you bound up the broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away. So sometimes in church, people get hurt. We may make a decision that you don't agree with. Sometimes decisions are made, and if you don't agree with it, people get hurt and they walk away. The pastor will say, no, what gaan aan? Wie doe ik wat gaan maken? Nee, die net my veel gekyk. And then for me, I'm thinking, jy moet net genad word. A veel kyk. But the pastor heart will say, that's alright man, let's forgive one another. The peacemaker, let's just love one another. Come on family. Joel Osteen is so you can see him. People love Joel Osteen because he's so compassionate. I mean, he, he doesn't like, you can see, confrontation intimidates him. Because he's a peacemaker. They attacked him when there was the floods in, 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 in Texas. Remember there was floods? And he didn't open his church to, to house victims. And the media got on him. And you could see how he crumbled. And then he eventually opened up because, again, things were flooded at his church. But you could see how easily they moved him because he's emotional. People testify of his church that... The first time they come to the church, sometimes they pull in the parking lot, they start crying because of the presence of God that's in that place. They feel the love of God in a way. They're like, what is it about this place? And you wonder why the thousands are there and people are crucifying him because his doctrine is not right. Stupid, idiotic people. 
No, seriously. And as people attacking him every week, there are people outside the building with, you are not saved, Joel Osteen. And God says, I'll still bless him. Because nobody is 100% right in doctrine. But yet, his mission, God said, provide hope for my people. It's pastoral. When he preaches, he encourages people. He may not give you step one, step two, which is the teaching gift. The teacher will give you things to do. And if you don't do it, and say, The pastor won't give you that. He gives you heart. He exhorts. It's the gift of exhortation. He encourages you. He makes you feel like, I can go on, man. I can, I can go on. I can do it another day. Where yell at me? And he, he goes and he finds the ones that have been wounded. It is interesting that this week, what was happening on the chat, and all the people, the pastoral gift says, let's go find them. Walk after them. Of you know, quarters of me. <laughs> go and fetch them. And say, Lord, good this man. Let's declare all his family business. You didn't divorce your father when he slapped you. He was still your father. When you argued with your sister, she's still your sister. That's a temporary relationship. What about this one? It's forever. You see where our priorities are. We would die for our physical family. But this family, that's forever. We won't invest. Notice Jesus' priority. Jesus said, he was preaching one day. His brothers and sisters came outside. And what did Jesus do? If you don't want to come to church... Who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? Those that do the will of my father, they are my brothers and my sisters and my mother. Because they didn't believe in him, his own family. They let them Jesus mal. So, but look where his commitment was. He says, if you don't want to honor God, you're in family. This is my family. See, what, see where our priorities, we don't say neglect your family. But before they are even your physical family, they need to be your spiritual family. Which is much more important because this relationship is forever. Ek is jou broer vir ewig of jy my like of nie. Ek gaan by jou huis kom in die jimmel. Elke week. Ek gaan sommer vir drie weke blij daar. Jy kan my niks maak jy. Kom maar met een smile. Sak kom hier rug. What are you doing here? Because he, on schan party, can you? But there will be no issues. Amen. We will love one another. But let's have some of that on earth. Thy kingdom. Amen. Neither have you brought them out, you driven away. Neither have you sought for that which is lost. So the pastoral gift will also be a soul winner. Amen. Because. We have family members here who have family members that are not saved. So we, as we come for you, we come for them. See the pastoral gift. I must reach you. But with force and cruelty have you ruled them. Again, your pastors have leadership responsibility over you to rule you. So sometimes you may not agree. But it does not mean you should not submit. We understand there are abuse of authority. How can you? You know, some people, you know what, when they, when they get to places of power and, 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 and authority, you, you see the childishness. You see how childish they are because why? And the Bible talks about it in the book of Ecclesiastes that it's a curse to a nation when children rule. So there are some leaders, grown men, and God says they are children. Because they throw tantrums. They don't know how to lead. They abuse their authority over the people. Imagine I abuse you and I still want loyalty from you. You must be retarded. If, if, if really, I mean really, I abuse you. Then I have a question as to your loyalty. And I demand it from you. This is what's happening out there. In the church even. I mean, you expect more from your pastor than you do from a, a child. But some of them, ay, when you see the immaturity, but they were a 20 run. I actually saw one day two pastors, praise the Lord. I saw two pastors fight over a tape. I was, I, was in the, I was running the bookshop at JCC, so I was selling tapes. 
So here these two pastors are standing before me. They want to buy this particular teaching. And I'll debate you for 50 rand. You should have been fighting. No, let me buy you one. No, no, Excel, that's what I wanted to see. Well, I said, no, you can buy it for me. No, you can buy it for me. Over 50. Hello, stingy. And then you see them trying to. Hey, you're a in the, in, the, in the line to pay for your goods, how can you ask a discount from the cashier? It was not the cashier shop. I It's like, ah, kick the pastor. You should be more generous than anybody else. We need to, if I take you out, I don't expect you to pay. You know, South Africa, we're different from the Americans. The Americans, if they invite you for lunch, you must pay. Don't, don't assume I'm paying. With us, we know if I invite you, I'm going to pay. It's a given. Of a vergative, yes, one. Because I mean, it, I know that's how it used to work. I know if I say, let's go out for lunch. If I say to let's go, I know I'm going to pay. But not there. As I wait, you saw nothing. I'm an alala ear shelter, telepatal. You saw what I said, you get nooks. I mark secret, mara itzi. As I lay eight invited, put money. You never know how you're going to be embarrassed. You see what I'm saying? We need to be the generous ones. Huh? Especially with waiters. Don't treat waiters bad, guys. Come on. Hey, that's one of my buddies says, Biki Streak. They say, hey, you must lopo. Hello, can you hope on your course? Because he's very strict with the, I said, no, treat them with respect. They're probably upset. The long hours sometimes, they, they can be irritated. They just need to be blessed. Don't you? I said, hot milk. Why is this cold milk? I looked at my buddy. I said, those he meant, sir. Said, hey, sorry, I, I think we made a mistake. Can I have a sample? Prad nice because ah, after <laughs> behind the scenes they're gonna say <laughs> I will bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so behave yourself. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> Let us continue. Say amen. Glory to God. Let's look at, as we looked at these verses, let's sum it up. The disease must be strengthened. Amen. And again, as, as, as a ministry grows, you can't expect the pastor to run after everybody. This is why he raises up people to do the work of the ministry. So if I say to you, go and attend to so and so then you know i should be having confidence that you know what to do in order to restore the bible is clear if someone is overtaken in a trespass you that are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering yourself lest you also be tempted because here's the thing when you judge somebody for their sin you open yourself up to be tempted in the same area and you are going to fall. If you judge, say, die mense, het in my tijd hulle vlees in orde kree. Dan kom kree, daar kree jy vlees probleme you never had before. Because you are a judge. And when you judge, you license demons to tempt you in the same area. And you can fall. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. The scriptures are clear. So if I'm coming to restore you, I must never come with a judgment. I'm come with compassion and say, if it was not for the grace of God, it could have been me. If it wasn't for the grace of God, it was me. And here's what God does sometimes. He takes the worst of the worst and makes them leaders so that they, are, no, they know they can't be arrogant because they know where they come from. God is so smart. When he, was, when he took Moses up the mountain and he was designing the clothing for the high priest, Aaron. Right? 
Aaron was leading the people in idolatry at the bottom of the mountain. He was building the golden calf and he led the whole nation into idolatry. Aaron. And yet God is designing his clothes to say he's going to be my high priest. Did God not know he was going to fall? God said, Latte fall. I saw any arrogant vias when he deals with the people. So every time someone came with their lamb to offer up for their sin offering, he couldn't say, What are you doing? You see what I'm saying? He couldn't say, I wonder what you did. Because now you come, Oh, yes, so dangas it's sin as a froge of fat, ne? He couldn't say nothing because everybody knew he sinned. Everybody knew he made a mistake. And then now he stands there in humility and saying, God, we are all messed up. Here we come to you. Help us. See what I'm saying? So that's why God uses the nothings of the world because they won't be arrogant. Have you ever noticed this? Notice this. Not a very highly educated people are used by God. You know why? Because they depend on their education. Have you noticed the more educated people are, the more atheistic they become? This is what the universities are doing to our children. They empower them away from God. And then they want to challenge you. Yes, because they they depend on the intellectualism. And God says he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He uses the foolishness of preaching to save people. They can't understand how does preaching draw people. Because psychologically it makes no sense. They forget the element of the Holy Spirit who draws people. (coughs) It's not intellectual at all. The Holy Spirit bypasses your intellect. Sometimes you don't understand something, but you know it's truth. Isn't it? There's a witness inside of you. Say, that is truth, whether I fully comprehend it or not. It's beyond the mind. And that's where God confuses them. Because they're so dependent on intellect that he can't use them. This is why the Apostle Paul was amazing. To throw all of his mind away and say, I count it down that I may win Christ. He laid his intelligence aside and allowed revelation to come through him. And that's why God could use him like that. But very few people want to do that. That are educated. Say I'm learning. Right. The disease are not strengthened. The sick, you have not healed them. You have not bound up the brokenhearted. Hmm? So in other words, I must strengthen the disease. I must heal the sick. I must bind up the brokenhearted. I must bring back those that are driven away. Because things happen. Relationships break. And sometimes you need to go and restore. And go seek after the loss. Hallelujah. And here's the cool thing about this part where where it speaks about uh, 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 you bind up the broken heart, the, the broken. It refers to, I never knew this, but sheep break their legs a lot. And then you need to put a stint and bind it up. And it's kind of interesting that God illustrates our relationship with him as sheep and shepherd. So if the sheep breaks his leg, he can't walk. And you need to fix it. So, a lot of times in your walk with God, you stumble and fall. And you can't get up by yourself. The pastoral anointing will come and lift you. Fix that leg. Let's put a stint in. Let's take you through a counseling process. And then uh, keep walking. Isn't that interesting? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod of the shepherd was never used to beat the sheep. The, the rod, you, you, you remember it's always had a hook, the staff. It was to pull you when you go astray from the flock. You anoint my head with oil because pests, flies and stuff would bug the sheep. So you oil them to keep that away. Demons are referred to as flies. 
Ne? Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, that's what Satan is called. So the oil, the pastoral oil that comes on you is to keep demons away from you. Ah, that's God of ours. Slim. Ah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus is called the chief shepherd. Let's go to... I want us to look at something here in the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 28. This is Peter. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Take heed to yourselves. So in other words, first of all, make sure you are solid. Make sure you are fed. Make sure you are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Take heed to yourself, right? And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost made you overseer. You don't call yourself. Hmm? So putting labels on people doesn't make them that. Yeah? I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. The Holy Ghost is the one who appoints an overseer. That's basically the word bishop. Today, bishop is such a big word. It only means overseer. <laughs> so in any group, if you have a group of, if you have a cell group and you're the overseer, you're the bishop. <laughs> but today, everybody wants to be a bishop. It's just an overseer. <laughs> <laughs> and to all the flock, notice the second part. Take heed to yourself. The word take heed means, you know, you guide, guard, and govern. You protect. You take heed. You are very focused on the protection of that sheep. Of yourself, your own life, guard your heart with all diligence. And then also to the flock. All the flock. In other words, there are people you might not like. Huh? They are in the church. And they're going to for Amal help my diner. <laughs> so regardless if you pastoral, all the flock. <laughs> you must go after them all. And then sometimes in, inside of you, you feel, I can't get I can't get I can't get <laughs> but God says all. So in, in other words, if they choose to leave, it must not be because you never went. It must not be because they never got the love they want. Amen? After I've reached out, I've done what God wanted me to do. And if you decide, that's next what I can mark, over which the Holy Ghost to feed the church of God. You'll always say feeding and pastor. Feeding and shepherd. Your job is to feed. Amen. Feed the church which he had purchased with his own blood. That's the word. The church is ecclesia. Ne? The called out ones. It's a special group. So from a group of people, you were handpicked. That's why you are the church. You were handpicked. Now, it cost Jesus his blood. So be careful how you treat these people. Pastor, what met him? Kinders rond slap en neeman sis. Mag hy hier jou kop afklap of iets? No, but I'm saying it's bad what's happening in the body of Christ. God made you, these people are so desperate, and then you use their vulnerability for your own personal gain. You need to be shot. Something, seriously. Jesus purchased them with his own blood. You better be careful how you treat them. Judgment is coming for pastors who've destroyed God's people, who destroyed families instead of restoring them. Destroyed relationships, messing in people's marriages, telling husbands, telling wives, lost him, man, he's slech, so that you can get there. Sis, man. Okay, let's take a track, amen. Oh, I've seen things in the body of Christ as Biki Erg. And I got eight minutes left. I'll have me met the lucht these days. Aish. Yeah, nee. 
ik zat met. <laughs> jo, ik <ek> word gebelag. <laughs> First Peter 5. The elders which are among you I exhort. So this is why when you, when you select eldership, usually you select people who are pastoral. And, and it does not mean every, every elder is not for the stage. Some people are gifted at one-on-one. But Alafal run to be stage. So don't put them under pressure because you're an elder, you must preach. No, some people are happy with one-on-one. They, can, they have such wisdom, they have such anointing to just help people one-on-one like that. So you have a group of elders who do pastoral work in the church. Amen? And they're able to minister the grace of God in that way. That's how we ought to build the family. You can't put it on one person. Each and every one of us can reach someone. Sometimes you just must go blom with people. You know how blom may help. Sometimes you don't want people to come preach to you, but just because I'm there and I'm just like, I was beginning to chips eat of it. Uh, I, was re- I was listening to someone last night. He was speaking about the, the, the culture we live in today. And he was saying, this new generation, they are not interested in what you know. And the leadership style of back then has to change because today they see value in your time that you spent with them. Because we live in such a fast world, it's busy, everybody's doing their own thing. So when I buy time out for you, it ministers volumes to people to say, yo, I'm important. Especially Joe, because it's fun. When you go to Durban and those places, the people are very relaxed. Like it's almost Noah Brio. Is it true? The Durbanites are very friendly. I know you, I, I fell in love with those people. I almost stayed there. But Jesus... I almost stayed there at one point because of their hospitality. But they don't understand when they came here, we were so busy. We had a conference. They came to visit, and we were busy working. And they're like, you were so nice in Durban. Now you're so narring. They like that word, Mosna. <laughs> you're so narring. You don't even. I said, guys, I am so sorry. I got work to do. I have to schedule you in. You understand? So this way today, when, you, when you're just there for someone, without having to preach to them, it ministers volumes. And I'm closing. <laughs> Seven duties <laughs> of a good shepherd for his sheep. He knows the state of his sheep. You have to know the state of your sheep. Ne? Right. He knows how to nourish, feed, reprove the sheep to bring them into a spiritual state of soundness. Amen. He knows how to rescue and restore the sheep who have fallen into sin. We talked about that. He knows how to find the sheep that has been driven away. (laughs) He knows how to bring the sheep back into the fold who have strayed into strange pastures. Some people are out there in the world now doing stuff they're not supposed to do. They need us to fetch them. Say amen. He knows how to oppose and expel wolves who have gotten in among the sheep and are, scat- and, have, and are scattering them from each other and from God. He knows how to preach, explain, and defend the truth for the sheep. Hallelujah. So we have to really, each one of us, have pastoral responsibility. Say amen. Amen. Because we can be a friend to anyone. Each of us can do that. Hallelujah. Let's stand. Praise God. (laughs) Father, thank you. You're going to raise up the shepherds. You're going to raise up those with a heart like the great shepherd Jesus who lays down his life for the sheep. My prayer is that that heart of compassion, Lord, would fill us that we will Go that extra mile to help someone come out from where they are. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your grace fill the church house. We pray for those that have left us because they were hurt by some decision we've made. They were wounded by some action on our part. 
We pray for their restoration. We pray for the wisdom of God and the grace of God to reach out and find them and bring them back to the church house. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Those of you watching us, Jesus is the great shepherd. Those of you listening to me, do you know the shepherd today? Do you want to meet the shepherd and make him your Lord? If you've never been saved or born again, we want to pray with you. Raise your hand and we will pray for you. And as we pray this prayer, I want you to say it from the depth of your heart and Jesus will save you. Say with me, Father. Thank you for Jesus, the great shepherd. He is calling me to his fold. So right now, Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. You died for me. Lay down your life so I can have life. So I thank you right now. I'm born again. I'm saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Amen. You take your seats. Next week, I will be concluding as we deal with the ministry of the teachers. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to have our announcements, tithes and offering. Let's welcome Brother Brandon as he comes to do...